Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on future test skills, less logistics, more thinking by Zuchi Systems. Myself, Flaney Susan John, Head of Marketing here, will be the host for the day. I, on behalf of the entire Zuchians, thank you all for the time you have dedicated today to attend this webinar. We have an eminent speaker today with us, and um, I can assure this will be worth your time. So here's some webinar housekeeping rules. Uh, be sure your audio is connected properly. All the participants' lines are muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please do type them out into the chat box. We'll be logging all the questions, and uh, our speaker will be answering them at the end of the session during the Q&A. So with us, let me introduce our speaker for the day, Paul Jaraj. I'm excited to have Paul with us today. I'm sure Paul will be a known name to many of you here as he has presented keynote talks and tutorials around the world. He brings with him 30 plus years of software development, testing and consulting experience. He is a principal at Jaraj Consulting Limited and an acknowledged consultant, author and coach in the areas of software testing and quality assurance, specializing in test assurance. He is a recipient of Eurostar Testing Excellence Award, Testa Lifetime Achievement Award, and the ISTQB Testing Excellence Award. He also hosts the Technology Leadership Forum, an organization that facilitates the professional and personal development of senior technology professionals. And well, when Paul's thoughts are not in the world of testing, he uses his time to write love poetry. That's interesting. And um, now I'll hand over the session to Paul to take over. All the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Lenny, uh, for the nice introduction. And I'll just uh, get my screen going. Uh, right, uh, what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about um, the concept of uh, tester skills, but I'm going to use the idea of logistics to separate the, uh, if you like, the local. Um, uh, practical skills you need to get the job done in your own business i'm going to separate those skills from the thinking skills that i think are universal and it's those universal skills that i think are not taught uh well enough or maybe not even taught at all and so i'm going to try and suggest and tell you a story of how i think that uh this is where we should be paying our attention and i'll talk about um a project that i'm working on uh, at the end uh to uh develop a uh, tester skills program, as we've called it, to deliver the skills in a more sophisticated way, let's say, than uh, current um, uh, schemes, let, let's call it. So, if I can get going, right. So, I want to talk about the, a day in the life of a tester. So, this might be very close to what you do if you work in an agile team, but even if you're not in an agile team, a lot of the activities you'll recognize as things that you do. Uh, if not every day, you do uh, regularly. So let me let me just start and just walk through these things. I want to identify the skills that might be required just to get through a single day in the life of a tester. So in the morning, we might have a meeting, a morning stand-up to uh, uh, have a retrospective of yesterday's activity uh, and to look at uh, what issues are arising in the day and describe the plan that everybody's going to work to. So we might have to talk about uh, yesterday's bugs. So we'll talk about bug ad advocacy. Uh, we might have to be quite assertive and say there are problems in yesterday's work that we've discovered that we need to uh, address. And we also obviously have to report progress in that respect. So what I'm going to go through is quite, quite quickly is just to uh, describe the variety of skills that are actually required. So perhaps in mid-morning, we're involved in a requirements workshop. We're there as the tester to, uh, if you like, challenge the uh, requirements that are being described by a, uh, a product owner or a user or a business analyst, perhaps. And, and what we tend to do is we, we, we try and understand the requirement. We model the requirement in our minds. We build a mental model, if you like. Uh, we look for things that can go wrong, so we're looking at risks. We're building, in our mind, tests because these tests are examples of how this requirement might be 
exercise. And quite often, the examples we come up with as a tester cause difficulty with the requirements because the requirements are usually not good enough to build software and certainly not to test. Then maybe later in the day, we're talking to the developers and we're talking about uh, maybe automation and we're kind of coaching them to uh, improve the depth and thoroughness and the coverage of their testing. So we're talking about coaching here, but we need to understand about automation, we need to understand coverage, and we might have to negotiate uh, with the developers to get them to uh, invest more time in the testing to save uh, more time later, if you like, because we need the developers to do a good level of coverage before we do integration and system testing perhaps later on. Now, maybe we do our, uh, our testing in the day and we're going to do uh, exploratory testing, no doubt, but we're also going to look at defects and do further investigations. But we also have to plan our work day by day and moment by moment. So we're scoping the work as well. We're scoping uh, maybe new features, perhaps. And then maybe towards the end of the day, we might be uh, reviewing the automation that's been running in the afternoon. So we have to do some interpretation. We have to maybe raise defects. We might have to critique the work that's been done, the automation itself or the coverage of the tests. And then maybe at the very end of the day, we plan for the, for the following day. So we might have to do some modeling to create tests and to create exploratory charters. We might have to plan new automation because the tests of today are going to go into the automation pack. Uh, we might have to do some estimation. There might be some maintenance as well of, of the automation. Who knows? At any rate, throughout the day, we're also talking about uh, the level, the depth and the availability of documentation. So we might be a very lightweight, uh, agile team and not document very much, but we might also work in a team that is very heavily dependent on large volumes of documentation. But documentation is always part of the game. Now, if you, just, if you look at all the little blue boxes on the right, the range of skills that a tester needs is, is, is quite extreme. It's much greater than you'd expect, say, with a developer or maybe even a, a business analyst or the users. The tester has to um, cover a lot of bases with their skills. So this is the challenge that we have in testing in that the range of skills is huge compared with what we believe are our technical skills. So technical skills are important, but there are a lot of business skills that we need to add and complement those. So I want to pay some attention to that idea as well. So, OK, as an introduction, that, that's, that's done. I'm going to talk about uh, patterns of development and the way we build software and how that affects uh, how we test in particular. I want to talk about uh, recent trends, in particular, continuous delivery. I'm going to use that as an example of how it challenges testers and, and, and uh, causes us problems when it comes to the skills we need. I'm going to uh, propose a new model for testing, which I've talk, been talking about for a few years now, but I use that to describe how we think as a tester and use that as the basis for defining our skills, our skill set, our thinking skill set. I want to talk about collaboration because collaboration is much more important than it used to be now. If we're all being uh, pressed to become more agile, we have to collaborate an awful lot more. And the tester typically is one of the more uh, one of the bigger con contributors to collaboration because we kind of question everything. We talk to everybody in the team. And finally, I'm going to talk about future testing skills and identify, I think, the skills that we actually need to be teaching and learning, of course. So I want to talk about development patterns first. So and I'm going to not dwell on this too long because it's kind of obvious and I don't want to make a too heavy point. But most people think that there are three development patterns, three uh, basic development patterns. One is structured or waterfall, let's say. One is agile and the other one is continuous delivery. Now, some people think agile and continuous delivery are kind of the same, but I'm going to argue that they're very different, uh, different disciplines. Now, one of the things that we can say between, say, waterfall and agile is that they're goal based. I mean, although they are different approaches, they are very much focused on achieving the delivery of software. With agile and continuous, we tend to work in autonomous teams. It's not project managed in the kind of traditional sense. The team controls its own destiny. And thirdly, with structured you know, waterfall, high process uh, waterfall uh, approaches and continuous delivery, which is largely automated, so it's got extremely disciplined process, structured and continuous are a very high process, high discipline approaches. So there are commonalities between the three ways, even though they are different, they're quite different. 
So what I did was I tried to look at some of the attributes of each uh, approach, each uh, model of development, if you like. And I'm looking at the structure of the team, the pace of delivery, the cadence, if you like, how it's led, the leadership, how we define requirements and testing and automation and measurements and governance. So those are the kind of uh, eight kind of uh, um, attributes of the three approaches that I uh, considered to create a table. So this is the table I created to describe the attributes of each of the three approaches. And the thing is, they're quite different. Now, if you look uh, on any row, uh, we can look at the structure as a first one. So the structured waterfall development is like a managed team, a project manager, a hierarchical team. With Agile, it's an autonomous group that there are no bosses, there are no managers in the Agile team, although the product owner takes some of the leadership role. But in a continuous delivery uh, team, it's like a production cell, like a production line with everybody working on a stage in a production cycle. Um, with leadership, you know, we have project managers. Uh, I think Agile is more like guided research. It's a bit like an academic project almost because we don't actually know whether we'll be able to deliver or not because as we learn, we change direction and the product evolves rather than is known ahead of time and, and completely architected. With continuous delivery, it's very much like a, a continuous delivery, a, a production line again. So it's line managed. It's a process, not a project, if you like, it's very different. If you look at testing uh, with structured, it tends to be scripted. Uh, agile tends to be primarily exploratory with, with certainly some automation, of course. And with continuous delivery, there's a big focus on automation. And so testing, the profile of the testing that's applied in these three approaches is, is, is somewhat different. Um, I'll do one more measurement. So in, 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 in structured waterfall projects, measurement is pervasive. We count everything. You know, so the project itself is estimated, it's drawn in stages, every stage is costed, and we use the calendar to measure progress through our plan. Measurement is everywhere. With Agile, measurement is kind of avoided, and there's, there's quite a, a meme uh, that describes this uh, no estimates kind of approach, uh, in that it's very hard to estimate. And, that, and the whole idea of using story points to estimate is, is kind of avoiding the reality of doing an estimate in the first place. With continuous delivery, it's driven by analytics, it's driven by data that's coming from our both manual and automated processes. So with continuous delivery, measurement is is pervasive, it's, 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 it's happening all the time. So you can see that the three approaches are different. So that's the point I really want to make with this. It's that uh, agile and continuous are not the same and we all know structured waterfall is very different from more modern approaches, we get that. But there are not three patterns, there are many, because every company does it differently. Every approach that's applied in every company is a hybrid of the three, it's a, it's a blend of uh, structured and agile and maybe some continuous delivery as well and that's the real point so everybody does it differently now fixed processes if you like waterfall is very the very last year let's say you know they are kind of regarded old-fashioned but with agile where well, agile has been around for uh, maybe more than 18 maybe 20 years now but even even now only half uh, the industry have moved into an agile way of working so we're still only halfway into the journey after so very long. We've been talking about shift left for decades and scaling agile is on everyone's agenda. Every big company wants to be agile, but they have big projects. So agile has to scale up and safe is one approach, but there are, there are criticisms of, of, of safe, of course. And continuous delivery seems to be the next big thing and DevOps and the whole collaborative approach uh, makes sense, of course. But um, we're still in a process of flux, and we hear uh, stories of citizen developers and developers and, and users creating their own systems. People are beginning to explore that. And robotic process automation as, a, as an adjunct to testing uh, with tools, uh, potentially uh, tools will replace people using our systems. So the issue we have as testers is everybody's doing it slightly differently. Some are going at a faster speed than others. And we need to step back and understand what we're trying to achieve. And this is where the idea of a different range of skills comes in. Now I'm gonna talk about continuous delivery very briefly because I want to use it as an example of the challenge we have as testers. 
So without uh, spending too much time on this, I mean, the, the, the usual explanation of continuous delivery is we squeeze our staged process into maybe a weekly or a daily or potentially even an hourly delivery. And within that very short cycle, we put in, if you like, a series of stages that compare with our um, uh, waterfall approach. So the challenge with, with this is, is that we, we, we basically scope our increments to such a size that we can make them much more predictable. So we can estimate that we can deliver them within uh, the week or two days or even within a day. So in order to do this, we have to be ruthless when we scope the, uh, scope the functionality that we're going to deliver. We assume we're going to automate much of the process and regression testing becomes a very large part of the process because that gives us the safety net to deliver in a rapid way. So we need a different test approach if testing is not to become a bottleneck. Manual testing won't work within a continuous delivery regime. Now, when people explain continuous delivery, you usually see you know, one or other pictures like this. And the most common one is this kind of infinite loop, a figure of eight, if you like where we, we basically cycle around this loop endlessly, maybe on a, a weekly uh, or over two, two or three days or even a daily uh, cycle. Now I've got a problem with this. And so what I want to, what I want to do is to explain uh, the thinking that goes into a model like that. If you unwrap the continuous delivery cycle, it looks just like waterfall. And that's the point I'm gonna make. It's a staged process, the way it is described. Now, we know that people are much more flexible in uh, continuous delivery teams using DevOps and are collaborating in a much more flexible way. Uh, and so this process isn't really followed anyway. So it, it's kind of hard to understand why people still promote this model because it doesn't describe what actually happens. So my suggestion is the infinite loop uh, you know, the infinity um, is really a waterfall, but it's it's still structured thinking. Now we know when when agile came along 20 years ago, the criticisms of of, of uh, sequential ways of working, of staged ways of working, is they're sequential. One stage follows another. You can't change the sequence of steps, and, and with with oh, obviously so, uh, there are dependencies, and and so dependencies drive progress. You can't jump into the process in the middle. It's not re-entrant. And, and even testing has stages itself. We know there's developer testing is a different stage from integration and system and maybe user testing. We still have testing stages. Uh, but in the uh, continuous delivery model, there's only one phase. It doesn't make any sense. We have, we have more than one phase and we have automated and we have manual testing too. So testing is squeezed. In, 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 in that model, and really testing happens continuously. We have to uh, regard testing as a continuous process, like the development is a continuous process, and the requirements analysis is a continuous process. We're learning all the time. And what happens with phase delivery is there are no feedback loops, and we know that what Agile gives us is rapid and continuous feedback. So we've got a problem with that kind of model. We need to think a bit differently. So what I want to do now is to uh, use the case that I think I've made for saying we need a new way of thinking to, to, to suggest a new way of thinking about testing. And I call this uh, like a new model for testing. It, it's a few years old now, but um, I still like to call it a new model because that gets people with attention, needless to say. It's a marketing ploy, perhaps. And what I want to do is to <clears throat> kind of get you to think a different way just for the next two or three minutes. I want to suggest that you forget logistics. And logistics are the things that vary wherever you act at a testing, whatever project, at whatever stage. And the way I'll describe this is I'm going to suggest it in a certain way. I'm gonna suggest this. I'm gonna suggest that I don't care whether you document your tests or not. It's not relevant. That's not testing, that's logistics. I don't care whether you're, you run your tests in an automated fashion or using a a tool or they do it manually or using some kind of magic it's not relevant to the thought process i don't care whether you're agile or waterfall or continuous delivery i don't care what business you're in i don't care what technology you're in and i don't care whether you're an individual or you're part of a large managed team you know there are no test managers 
So if you like, what I'm trying to suggest you do is just separate all these things that are logistics away from what you think of as testing. Now you might think there's nothing left. I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, logistics are in, terribly important, but they're not testing, okay? They're not, they don't affect or impinge on the testing thought process. That's what I'm trying to get to. So let me now sort of make a statement that all testing is exploratory, whether we are using scripted testing or whether we're, we're doing some freestyle testing without any documentation at all, all testing is exploratory. And the way it works is this, we explore our sources of knowledge, our sources of information, whether it's requirements, the system itself, we've got our own experience, we interview people, we doodle on whiteboards, we uh, read documentation, whatever. We have sources, we explore those sources of knowledge. And what we do is we build mental models. And those mental models help us to simplify the complexities of modern systems. So, these models allow us to understand the requirement, but they also allow us to uh, select things to test. The model identifies things to test. When we have a model that is meaningful, and we can identify things to test, what I'm gonna suggest is it, is it informs our testing. It doesn't do our testing for us, but it allows us to identify meaningful tests from that model that when we share our tests and say we are covering that model, other people understand because we usually, we try and share our models. So that's the, 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 the view from the top of the mountain. So let's come halfway down and let me just break that uh, high level mission statement down a little bit, maybe. On the left, we've got this idea of exploring our sources. And what we're doing is we're creating mental models. We're creating test models, if you like. And what happens is when we think we know enough, we say, uh -huh, I know enough to be able to identify things to test. And so we shift from exploring to running tests. So when our model is good enough in our mind, we think now I can identify things to test and I can start running, creating and running tests. So on the left hand side, we're creating test models. On the right hand side, we're using those models to derive tests and to run tests and to interpret results. But what often happens is uh, the system doesn't behave exactly the way we expect. And it might be a bug, but it might also be a misunderstanding of the requirement, and meaning our model isn't good enough. Our understanding isn't good enough. We need to read a bit more of the requirement, or we need to ask the users some deeper, detailed questions or we need to have a conversation with the developers to understand what their interpretation is because it might be different from ours. Their model might be different from our model. So we tend to want to be on the right, but very often we have to go back to the beginning on the left and explore our sources and ask people for more information. This is very common. So uh, we might go through this loop more than once you know, for a very complex feature, but the idea is we want to be testing having created our mental models, which is our understanding. And in everything that follows, when I use the word model, uh, you could substitute the word understanding. We need to understand what the system should do before we can articulate a test and before we can uh, interpret a result. Okay, so models equals understanding. Let's look at it that way. The last thing on this picture I want to say is, we have to use our judgment. Somewhere in the middle of this kind of, these two modes of thinking uh, is a judgment. Are our models are adequate or our models are not adequate? We have to use our judgment. And I can't tell you what's inside the green blob except you know this is how you operate as a tester. Now, the question might arise, well, do developers think the same way? And I, I don't want to talk about this for very long, but my suggestion is I think so. They have exactly the same problem of creating software as we do in testing it, in that when you create software, you have to build a mental model, and a mental model will help you then to create uh, the algorithms and, and process flows in software to deliver the functionality. But don't forget, the developer has to test the software they create too. So they're building mental models that help them to test too. Now, where we differ from uh, uh, developers is the developer's mental model is probably more influenced by the code and the way it's built and the way it's designed, whereas 
our mental model as testers is more influenced by what the user asks for and what their intentions are because we look at what the business are trying to achieve with software so although we don't have the same model we might have a very similar thinking process to create our models now let's go into it uh, that was halfway up the mountain now let's go and into the detail and i'll do this very quickly because i i uh, uh, want to just give you a, a sense of how this this works this this thinking model works so on the left hand side we've got sources of information it could be the system and a task could be requirements what i call definitions if you like um, it could be interviews with people it could be our own experience and our own prejudices and biases so we're all fallible in that regard but what we do is we ask questions of our sources we inquire and what we then do is we build mental models as we learn more from uh, our sources we build mental models so we understand or attempt to understand how this software will work now when our model reaches a certain point of maturity we can then start using the model to make predictions so you can say things like if I understand the requirement correctly when I input a B and C then the system should do D E and F and if the requirement is not clear or it's ambiguous or has gaps i can use these predictions to ask challenging questions of our sources so I, I can go back to our users and say if i understand the requirement properly input abc well that should produce def is that correct yes or no and sometimes the answer is yes that's exactly how it works but sometimes the users will say oh no we've never done that before that's not how it should work at all how did you get that idea well i read your requirement and if i read your requirement and make that interpretation the developers might make the same interpretation or might make a different interpretation who knows but this idea of uh, building mental models making predictions and then challenging our sources is critical to getting the requirements right because it's a it's a truism to say that if i can't test the software the developers can't build it because they have exactly the same challenge of knowledge they need to understand and build mental models just the same way as we do so that's the left hand side at some point i'm going to be happy that my mental model is okay and i can't think of anything wrong with the requirements anymore so let's move that to the left so now i've got my model and what i can do is i can use that model to inform my testing so my model might be something as mundane as as, as a, a flow chart so i can trace paths through a flow chart it might be a state, state diagram. It might be a table of uh, logical conditions, like a decision table. It, in, in every case, we can use that model to identify things to test. When we run our tests, I'm going to use the word apply, applying, because I don't care whether I run that text, test, I execute that test using a tool, or I do it by hand. It doesn't matter, because that doesn't affect how I think, OK? Now, there's more to running tests manually than just executing the test, but that's what this applying uh, stage is actually about. It's about execution of the test, not interpretation, because interpretation is a separate activity, usually done by people. Now, computers can do some interpretation, but typically all they can do is judge whether something is a perfect match. But what uh, humans do is we see a bigger picture. We see things the tool is looking for. And when we run 100 tests, someone has to figure out what those 100 tests are actually telling us. So interpretation is a broader view. Now, if we find a bug, uh, we might log it and revise the system and then reapply the test. So uh, the revise the system part isn't part of the mental model, but I just want to say that's where bugs would fit. Now, the other thing that happens is uh, when we test, we report to our stakeholders to share what we've learned when we've run our tests. And also something that happens quite often is when we run our tests, we get results that make us think something is wrong with our model. and Maybe we have to go back to our model. And sometimes we have to go right back to the beginning and that maybe the requirement is wrong. The understanding of the requirement from a developer's point of view might be different from the tester's point of view. That's perfectly possible and it's quite common. So sometimes we have to go back to our source of information, go and talk to the users. So all these various arrows coming out of the testing uh, blob in the middle of the screen reflect the outcomes from running tests. Now, when you glue it all together, this is what you kind of get. Now, um, it looks a little bit like a, a 
creepy crawly like a bug doesn't it but but that's not the intention that's just the way it turned out and this is what i'm calling uh, like the new model now what does this model represent it represents the thinking processes inquiring modeling informing applying reporting etc there are 10 of these activities now each of these activities has a physical manifestation as well as a thought process i'm just looking at the thought processes now you might hang your logistics your physical activities off uh, this picture if you like and some activities span more than one thinking activity and that makes sense so uh, reviewing is basically the left hand side you know so when we read a document we make medlands models we make predictions and then challenge the requirement because we can see an anomaly that's what you would do when you're doing a review of a requirement of a, of a document or even something like a user story perhaps so what this is what this represents is not a staged process it represents a series of modes of thinking which uh, humans can undertake maybe two three four simultaneously it's not a an end-to-end -end process it's it's a it's a picture of the way our mind moves as we have conversations, as we read, as we experience the system under test. Our mind has to do 10 activities, not just one or two. It's not as simple as that. Uh, now, I think I've just said what's on here, but, but what I want to focus on is our mind is, is jumping around this, this kind of process, and it's not driven like a, a stage process. It's driven by events. It's a dynamic uh, thing. Uh, the phone rings, a colleague interrupts us. We discover a, an anomaly, which looks like a bug. These are events that change what we do, and we have to adjust and adapt our thinking, and then our process moves as well. It's a dynamic process. Now, the comparison I would make it's, it's like when um, you might have, if you're a, a, an older tester or maybe you're testing uh, mainframe systems, maybe one or two of you are, um, with green screens, the, the sequence of events on a green screen was you start at the top left and you tap through the fields in one direction. You could go forwards or you could go backwards, but you could only hit the fields in a, in a certain sequence. With GUI screens, that all changed. You can enter data in any order, there's all sorts of things you can do outside just data entry. And then there are other applications running on your PCs or workstations and so on. It's a much more complicated dynamic thing. And in the same way, our processes when we test, our thinking processes are much more dynamic than a staged process. And it's kind of the similar kind of thing has happened. It's suddenly, it's actually much more complicated than we try and say it is. Um, but at any rate, whenever one of these events happens, our response to that event is what matters. So here's a suggestion that actually, when we look at the status of a feature, say, um, I suggest that um, we regard the status of that feature as what are we thinking? What are we doing with that feature right now? So are we still asking questions? Are we inquiring? Or are we still trying to understand the requirement? Are we able to make predictions from our mental model, that is, from the requirements? Are we still challenging? Do we have outstanding anomalies in requirements? Or are we now moving into testing because we uh, we've built a mental model from which we can derive test cases and so on? So rather than say where a feature is in a Kanban board, uh, my suggestion is that we, we could still have a Kanban board, but the column headings are what we are thinking about not where it is in some logistical process because we're not talking about physical items we're talking about what we're thinking now if it's documented that might be a document but if we're not writing documents down it's all in people's heads it's where we are thinking that defines the status of the future so this is my argument about how we think about continuous delivery in particular but how we think about all processes, that we are working in a dynamic, event-driven uh, world, not a staged world. So continuous understanding is, is, is like, as we move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of, of my model, on the left-hand side, we're kind of planning and we're trying to understand the definition, the requirement, you might say. I call it the definition. And on the right, we're trying to understand the delivery. 
So we need to do both. We need to understand the requirements before we can test and understand the delivery. So continuous understanding is, a, is a, not a staged process. It's a continuous learning process. So uh, we might need tools to support this, and I don't want to talk about this at all, really, because it's, it's probably out of scope, I think, for this talk. But we don't have tools yet that support our thinking, certainly on the left-hand side, as, as well as we need. But I think this is where the tools industry needs to go to support better modeling and thinking and uh, challenging. So I want to talk about skills. And um, this is the last part of, of, of the talk, if you like. Um, uh, the year before last, I uh, was asked to get involved with a project with, in Cork, in Ireland, with um, 20 software businesses, 20 QA managers, let's say. And their challenge was uh, finding and retaining good testers. And their view was that, for example, if they hire computer science graduates, these computer science graduates may know how to write some code and understand a little bit about architecture, but they had no knowledge, almost no knowledge of testing. So they're kind of a blank page. So what uh, the QA managers needed or want require is a, an identification of the skills that their people need, and they need a mechanism for uh, embedding those skills to uh, develop those individuals to a productive, to become a productive tester, professional tester, if you like. Now, I, I won't go through the process we we followed. It's just it's it's not really helpful anyway. But uh, this was like the first slide of the first meeting in November 2018, and uh, it was sponsored by uh, Skillnet, uh, an Irish uh, government agency who promote better skills in the tech community, and Softest Ireland, who are the special interest group for testing in Ireland. Um, now there were no, it wasn't driven by training providers. So although I am personally a, a training provider, I was a facilitator to helping them to identify the skills they need. So I wasn't trying to, uh, if you like, uh, promote what I can sell. It was more about uh, to identify what their actual needs were. It's customer driven. And because of that, I think it's a more accurate reflection of the requirements of the industry. Now, I'm just going to go through very quickly a list of, uh, I think, nearly 40 um, actual skills that were identified by the team and uh, I think are all relevant. So uh, the ones in red are the ones that I think you probably uh, wouldn't see in a traditional, let's call it, uh, testing class. So um, the first, very first one, adapting testing. Well, it's like I don't see any anyone teaching how we adapt testing as a as a as a skill, if you like. Um, so when you encounter a new application or a new technology, or you're in a new project, or you move to another company, um, you have to adapt your skills to that different environment. Now you could say that's a context. Of course it is, uh, but I'm not uh, arguing for context driven. I'm just suggesting that that when you encounter a different set of circumstances, you have to adapt your approach. So we have to understand, we have to have a skill of adaptation of our, of our testing. Um, assertiveness, I'm just going to go through two or three. So assertiveness, of course, we have some difficult conversations sometimes. Sometimes we need to argue for more testing, and our bosses say there simply isn't the budget to do that. Now, we might still lose the argument, but we need to make a good case. But assertiveness is about having a grown-up conversation with senior people. Uh, challenging requirements. Again, one of the biggest values of testers is they have a critical eye on requirements. So we have to uh, encourage those skills and teach people those skills to critique requirements and to challenge the sources of knowledge, usually uh, business people. And you can see, you know, throughout all the C's, coaching, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, these are all things that you might recognize as, well, it's obvious we need to do these things, but it's very rare for technologists, people in the testing or the development community, to go on interpersonal skills classes or business skills classes. Um, these are the things that we need to bring into our skill set and encourage, certainly in the testing community. And you can see others. Uh, now, this is just page one. There's another page. You know, you've probably heard people talk about systems thinking, and systems thinking is a is a discipline, a, a thinking discipline. 
test assurance is a more like a higher level view of what testing is doing for an organization or, or for a team. Um, so test assurance, there are there's specific skills of how we coach uh, a team to do better testing, but also we need to know how to review their performance in some way and critique their performance. Um, test motivation, another one, testability, that's becoming increasingly important. It's always been important, but it's now emerging as something that people recognize as critical and developers need to understand testability in a much better way. And typically it's testers who coach testability. And working remotely, I mean, in these days where we have the virus and things, working remotely is suddenly uh, what we're all doing. And yet uh, there's very little uh, on the market to help people understand how they behave, how they manage people remotely, how they operate and contribute uh, remotely. So that's the range of skills. And the rest of the, all the blue ones are probably things you would, you would recognize before. Uh, but that's the range of skills. It's a very large range of skills for a good professional tester. Now, uh, what I've done is I've structured this into, uh, sorry, I've, I've taken what was identified as foundational out of those 40 skills uh, into uh, a kind of a, a recipe book or a, 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 a structure uh, for teaching those skills. And you'll see numbers against uh, many of those topics, and those are the number of minutes teaching. So uh, I started building material, and I'm probably about 60% of the way through creating a foundation class. Um, and you can see that the time um, applied to uh, thinking activities, so you've got like in the core modules, the, the middle on the left, thinking, there's, there's a whole section on system thinking, modeling, which is a thinking process, and critical thinking as well. So you'll see that we've tried to introduce the thinking skills into a testing class at last because this has been missing for so many years. Now, what we've created is a learning and development scheme. It's not just classroom teaching or online training. For every hour of classroom teaching or online training, there should be one to two hours of local mentoring and coaching by people who bring, if you like, the theory, you could call this the, 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 the thinking skills, you could call it the theory, if you like, but the logistical skills that have to be uh, uh, applied using those thinking processes. So wherever you work, your company will do things differently. And that's the part where you have to get that knowledge from your local peers and managers and maybe local training as well. So that's the idea is that it's a learning and development scheme to give people a framework for the thinking and to ask intelligent questions about what they need to know and then to uh, require their local authorities, if you like, uh, managers and peers, to explain to them how that thinking fits into the logistics in the projects they're going to be part of. So uh, learning and development scheme, not just classroom. So here's my last slide. Um, we need to pay attention to how we deal with event-driven continuous approaches rather than linear approaches. The world is going agile, the world is trying to go continuous, but all our processes are hybrids. And we all do it differently. So we have to be much more flexible in our thinking to adapt to different environments. We're going to be more distributed. It's inevitable that with the virus, but the way the world is moving is we're going to be working in more and more distributed teams by uh, and do distributed testing. And I think we need fewer testers in the world, but we need smarter testers to be more effective and more productive. We need a broader set of thinking, business and personal skills to deliver a good testing service. Uh, and this, this is the, the requirement but we need the local skills to embed into our processes in our uh, working environments. So if you like, the thinking skills are global, logistics are local. And we can't teach, I can't teach logistics to any of you because you all work differently and you all have your own unique way of operating. So we should separate the global uh, activities which can be taught from the local logistical activities which have to be learned locally. So one last thing, um, I'm looking to build classes uh, to deliver all this stuff. I'm about 60% of the way through of a foundation level, and that's about four days of a seven-day class. 
So it's a much more substantial piece of, of learning, if you like, than you might be used to. Uh, but I'm looking for people who will uh, act as beta testers, who will review what I'm producing and at no charge to you. I mean, I'm, I, this would be a great favor to me if you can help me to refine what I'm creating. But I'm looking for volunteers to take a look at what I'm doing and maybe go through the classes and uh, I will coach you as well. So we'll come to some arrangement about me helping you to get through these things as well. And right now we'll do it all online, but uh, it's the idea is it would be a classroom class as well, um, eventually, <laughs> when we come out of this uh, crisis. Um, I think I'm done. Uh, my email address is there. Uh, do connect with me on LinkedIn. I usually say yes. It's very rarely I say no. Uh, and at this point, I think I will hand over to Linny. Hi, Linny, you there? Yes, Paul. Um... So if you take control, you don't need to take control, I think. You just need to look at the questions. Oh, I wanted that. I was just checking for the screen if it's working fine. Yeah, OK, so anyhow, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, that was a great session and um, very informative. And I'm sure the the the, the tester skill program that you are talking about is going to be uh, great. Um, so you have invited beta testers. So I'm hoping you will have volunteers from here. So um, <laughs> yeah. So um, we have a couple of questions here, but um, at this time I um, request the audience to please post your uh, questions uh, here as uh, I'm gonna get some of them answered uh, by Paul. So yeah, Paul, so uh, the first question I have here is uh, how can testers uh, develop thinking? Is there a methodical way? Sorry, could you say that again, Lily? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. How can testers develop thinking? Is there a methodical way? Um, well, I, I think, <laughs> right. So the challenge is it's kind of hard to think about how you're thinking. Um, I mean, literally, that's what philosophy is, in that that's what philosophers do all day, I think. Um, so. What I've tried to do with the model is to give you kind of a roadmap. And if you had it in front of you, let's say you print it out on a piece of A4 in front of you, and you're having a conversation with a developer. One of the things that I find useful when talking with people in projects is in the conversation, you can sort of say, well, where is our thinking now? You know, am I, am I still asking questions about the requirement, or am I creating tests, or am I interpreting results? Where am I in my thinking on my, my picture on the new model? And the response from the developer might be, well, uh, you're still asking questions about requirements. Well, I'm writing code and I'm, I'm, I'm nearly done. I'm nearly finished. I'm nearly handing over. So you're in a different place. So one of the things I didn't say in, in, the, in the presentation is you can use the model to help you understand where your thinking is. And by doing so, you can, you can find uh, a, a discrepancy or a conflict in your projects between where you are thinking and where your teammates are thinking. Now, the other angle is once you begin to understand what's going through your head, you can improve on it. So once you understand what your brain is trying to achieve, you can say, right, I'm, I need to uh, be more focused on challenging requirements. So when I read a requirement and I build my mental model, I need to be thinking about how I test it. And that's a natural thing to do once you've got software, but we need to do that with requirements too, to challenge requirements and to come up with good examples. So although they could be looked at as test cases, I like to call them examples on the left-hand side. So understanding how we can add value to our projects by asking good questions, and those good questions are really examples for people to consider, I think once you can think about how you think. This is sound very circular. Once you, once you can 
understand what you are thinking about and, and what process you're following, you can focus on those activities and perhaps improve them and recognize what, you're, what you need to do in each, in each stage. Oh, yep. that's okay. Great. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, Paul, there's a uh, next question from Jason. Uh, he asked, would Paul like beta testers for his course to be new to the industry or experienced ones? Um, well, I think the answer to that is both, because um, in principle, uh, it's the way, where we started with identifying all the skills is we started with a clean piece of paper. And so we thought that any, let's say, a, a, an intelligent person, okay, who's going to be a tester, but who knows nothing about testing, that's the range of skills. So the target um, uh, students, if you like, are people with no experience. However, we definitely need uh, feedback from people who are experienced because uh, only experienced people will recognize, well, is this, is this matching my expectations? Is this, max, ma is this matching how I think about uh, uh, testing? So I think, I think the short answer is um, I need both. Um, and, but I wouldn't want it to be just experienced people because I think we need some newbies to take a, a clean look at it and to be completely independent, if you like. They don't have any prejudices or pre, pre uh uh, preconditions or um, uh, so I, I think anybody <laughs> probably the, the shortest answer is I think anyone with experience or no experience I think anybody right. uh, with with a with the intention of learning about testing uh, would be really really helpful thank you yeah fair enough yeah so Paul the next question is you say for each hour of training material there needs to be two hours of local support what support do you think is required well, in the in the class, what I've tried to do is in certainly in the earlier uh, sections, because it's kind of trying to set the scene and put uh, the learning into context. Um, the assignments are things like um, go and uh, like 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 one of the very early um, lessons is about stakeholders and stakeholders. Testing stakeholders are your customers. Who are you going to give your results to? Who are going to make a decision based on your results? So developers are your stakeholders. Uh, maybe senior users are your stakeholders. The product owner may be a stakeholder. The project manager may be a stakeholder. And they all have slightly different roles. So one of the early assignments is go and talk to your stakeholders and or go and talk to your peers or your manager and ask them who your stakeholders are and maybe in introduce them to you so you can ask some relevant questions and i try and give people good questions to ask as well in the early days so the assignments are very often about having a conversation with your peers or your manager or your stakeholders or the automation guy or your technical architect uh, that kind of thing so um the support is you know I, I can't answer the questions about local practice okay so i can't answer the questions about your stakeholders because i don't know who they are only you can discover who they are so what I try and do is give you a sense of what those relationships are and then give you some questions to ask them that are meaningful, that will help you understand what those relationships, how those relationships work. And the same goes for um, other things like prioritization. I mean, like if you've never tested before, it's probably hard to understand what's in people's heads when you start prioritizing um, tests or features or or test results, you know, uh, bugs to fix. So um, quite a lot of the assignments are in encouraging you to have conversation with your peers and your peers and your managers and who else are the people who will provide that support. And that's kind of the idea of how it works. If, does that make sense? I, I think that's the way I would, yeah. I would uh, answer that. Definitely does, yeah. So uh, the question we have here, Paul, is um, are there practical testing exercises in the classes, in particular, exploratory testing of real software? Uh, yes. So it all sounds a bit theoretical, doesn't it? Uh, and what I don't want, I don't want to give you that impression. And, and the uh, second half of the classes are, I mean, there are practical exercises throughout, don't get me wrong, but uh, hands-on testing of software uh, is in the uh, days um, uh, four, five, six, and seven. So um, uh, 
it's I'm still working on this, but essentially I've got an application which is about 50,000 lines of code. And uh, it's an application I I uh, I put together over the course of four years, which is a product which I tried to sell, and it didn't sell. Okay, so so what I've got is I've got 50,000 lines of Python, which is a uh, software as a service application with uh, about 150 screens. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create exercises to test that application. So if you like, uh, there will be uh, quite a lot of practical exploratory testing of real software. And uh, one of the features of, this, of that system, of that application, is a bug reporting uh, part of it. Uh, it's got a a, a, um, a story management uh, feature as well. You have to manage uh, BDD, um, uh, cucumber style stories and stuff like that. It's got a stakeholder management feature as well. So a lot of the things I'm trying to teach are actually built into this application. So uh, I'm hoping to create some really good assignments to allow people to explore that product uh, in safety. And because it's a known product, because I've got the source code, I know where the bugs are. So if you find bugs, I can tell you as a developer, that's a bug, uh, good one. And I'll leave the bug in because I want that to be found by other people, of course. Um, but it, it will have a lot of practical uh, content as well. Uh, but the early, the early sessions are a bit more theoretical, I have to admit. But you need to get your head in the right place. And that's the reason for that. So. Okay, so uh, one last question we have is, um, can you please um, uh, repeat a bit on new model testing, what exactly it is? Uh, what is the new model? Is, is that the question? New what, model, what is the new, new model, model testing? New model testing. Uh, okay, um, so it's, it's a thinking, it's a model of our thinking. So it doesn't encourage you to test any differently. It's not a process to follow. What it is, it allows you to understand if you are working in a waterfall, staged, structured project, working for a bank on big projects, it will help you to understand the thinking that goes into the activities that you do locally. It will help you to understand why requirements are done the way they are how you do um, requirements reviews, how you design tests, and um, the thinking about modeling, which is not well taught, I have to say, and so on. If you work in an agile team, you can use the same thinking model to map to your activities in your agile team as well. Because I've, because I've taken all the logistics out, what you're left with is what I might call a pure testing thought process. It's, I want to suggest, I mean, it might not be, but I want to suggest that it's universal. We, it's not, I can't tell you what, what you think, but I can, I can perhaps suggest that these are the modes of thinking you have to go through. So it should help you to understand how you test your systems locally. It should help you to understand what's going on in your head, what's going on in other testers' head, and to other people who test. Developers test as well. So when you talk to developers, show them the model and say, look, yeah, if you can understand how this model works, we, we've both got a common way of thinking. And when I'm saying I'm still asking questions of requirements and you're saying you are uh, writing tests and running tests, we're in, the, we're in a different place here. There's a problem. There's a schism in our project. So it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a process to follow. It's a, 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 an aid to you understanding how you think and how the logistics you apply locally are actually being used and how they are being applied because it's a thinking that drives logistics not the other way around we're too often driven by processes and we're driven by how tools work and we're driven by uh, how people behave almost and and really we should we should we should have a better goal in our thinking I, I, my, my belief is this this should help you to understand how you make progress in your thinking. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that that's helps. a long-winded that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that definitely helps. So uh, this was our last um, question. And um, with this, uh, I think it's time for us to wrap the session. Um, thanks once again to Paul and all the great audiences that uh, we had today. 
So audience, if you feel that you missed to ask a question that you had at the session, uh, please feel free to write them to us at the email ID that you see here in the screen, sales at zuchisystems.com. I welcome you all to follow Zuchi Systems in the social platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We share some great content there that can help you. You can also be informed about all the webinars that's lined up for the days to come. So please stay tuned. We hope that you all and your families are safe amidst these tough times that we are going through. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.